Our first speaker, plenary speaker for the day, is Dennis Patton, who needs no introduction. I'm sure all, almost all of you know Dennis Patton, right? Dennis Patton has worked with the Kansas State Research and Extension for over 30 years as a horticulture agent. In his position, his, uh, uh, he works with homeowners and related businesses to promote best management practices and environmentally sound horticulture recommendations. Dennis is a frequent contributor to local gardening publications and the Kansas City Star Grow Sections. He has been named a national winner for best personal columns by his peers. In addition, he coordinates the Volunteer Johnson County Extension Master Gardener Program, which has nearly 400 trained volunteers that assist with educational programming. These volunteers donate more than 48,000 hours of service each year in projects such as a phone, phone hotline, speakers bureau, and maintaining three demonstration gardens. A graduate of Kansas State University with a Bachelor of Science degree in horticulture and a master's degree in adult education, Dennis enjoys the many opportunities and extension. Dennis also serves on the Horticultural Sciences Advisory Board at JCCC. Today, Dennis will present 21st Century Horticulture Innovations, Trends, and Challenges. Thank you, Dennis. Well, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. It's really great to be with you this morning. Um, when I was asked to do this topic, I kind of freaked out because uh, this is not a topic I usually present. I'm more of the horticulturist guy. You plant the tree in the ground, six inches deep, 12 inches apart. Uh, so doing something on trends, uh, challenges, innovations is a little bit different. So kind of going to set some ground rules here. Uh, I'm not a futurist. I'm just a horticulturist, OK? I just listen to people, talk to people in my job. Uh, I have the same ability to see in the future than, than you, as you do. And uh, I'm going to say, some of you may not like what I'm going to say, but this is my opinion. And you can agree with me or not. And I'm also going to say, I may not be correct, because I'm not a futurist. I'm just a common Johnson County person, passionate about the horticulture industry, and want to see it grow and prosper. And also, I'm here because I was asked to present. So that, that's kind of my ground rules for this presentation today. So let me give you some of my background. I also can relate to these students here. I have a freshman in college. I have a sophomore at home. So I can relate to where you guys are in your stages of life as students, trying to decide what your future is going to be. I can also, believe it or not, relate back to what my challenges were. I think I had it very easy, because I knew I wanted to go into horticulture. But times have changed drastically. Um, as I was getting ready for this presentation, I happened on these pictures. This one here on the left, that's my dad's view. I grew up on a Kansas wheat farm. That was my dad's view of farming. The picture on the right is my very early stages of remembering my grandfather on the farm harvesting wheat. Now my children, who are 19 and almost 17, have no images of this. They now see these huge combines when they go visit the farm. It's automated. There's not a lot of work. So just in these 50 years or so, there has been a huge shift of how we view agriculture, which horticulture is part of. So I think understanding the future is more of what our vision is. And I think we also need to look more than just at ourselves. We need to look how others view the world of horticulture. Uh, we also need to look how the industry itself views horticulture. And more and more, we always have to react to what the society thinks our future should be and how societal changes affect horticulture. And then how will we react to these changes, whether in industry, society, is going to really shape the future of where this industry goes. So I'm going to take another trip down memory lane. So for you guys in high school, you're going to be totally clueless. So right now, maybe looking at some of these older baby boomers out here in the audience, they might, uh, might have a better connection to these examples. When I grew up as a kid, I loved getting up on Saturday morning and watching the Victory Garden. Okay? Jim Crockett here on the left. That man knew everything in my world. Oh my gosh, he could plant and grow everything. And then Jim Wilson came on the scene. And then it really took a turn with Roger Swain. So, high school students, how many people have ever heard of a show called The Victory Garden? A few of you have, okay. Well, The Victory Garden is still on PBS, but can any of us name the host? No. <laughs> I have no idea who the host of The Victory Garden is. 
To me now, when I have tuned in to the Victory Garden, it's a travel show. All you're doing is going from coast to coast seeing someone else's garden. It's not really about learning how to garden, how to plant, how to engage. It's more fluff. Um, it's also a cooking show now, you know? <laughs> Food, horticulture has all come together. And really, it's a lifestyle show. And I think that's kind of the theme of what's happening in the world of horticulture. It's not so much about gardening anymore as it is about lifestyles, okay? Uh, and as I said, you even know it's still on PBS. And honestly, I don't think I've seen it probably for, for a year or more. Does the website say, learn how to garden? No, to me it says it's learn how to cook, um, how to eat, but very little about actually doing. Okay, how many of you know what HGTV is? Home and Garden Television. You know what the new name for HGTV is? Home and Garage Television. <laughs> how often do you see a gardening program on HGTV? G T V. It's hard pressed to find. It's all back about lifestyle. It's all about living. It's really not about gardening anymore. Not how to plant, how to till, how to prune. In my estimations, it's more like putting a throw pillow on a couch, is how they treat gardening on HGTV, which is actually home and garden television. It's all about lifestyles. So, when I was your guy's age, I looked at gardening as a hobby, as fun, as a career, as a profession. And Seth, I think, gave the definition of a job versus a career, which sets the stage. I didn't look at it as just as, as work. I looked at it as a career, as a profession that I wanted to be part of and earn my living from. So, what's the meaning of gardening today to the average person? Bugs? Chores. Chores. Yeah. Yeah. To the average person today, and we're probably not the average person when it comes to this topic, by the way, okay? As you probably already picked up kids in class, a lot of people probably wonder why you're in the horticulture program, right? Okay? Today, average society people, gardening is nothing but work, work, and more work. Today, they want outdoor living solutions. And I think Dalton kind of touched on this in some of his slides about what the industry does. It's not so much about gardening anymore, but it's outdoor living solutions. It's a lifestyle. So let's look at what others are saying about children or about horticulture. So what about kids? Okay. Do kids go outside and play today? Now, you guys may be a little bit different because you're into horticulture and gardening, <laughs> but think about the average kids. Do they go out and play? Yeah. I know where my two sons spend all their time. One is on Xbox and PlayStation, and uh, the other one is <coughs> listening to music or, or doing something else. I have to fight with them to go outside, and I, I'm the gardener. I love this. They should have grown up with it. And then the other question for those kids that do go outside, is their own free will or is it because they're forced to go outside? You know, in my generation, you had to go out to play. There wasn't TV 24-7. There wasn't electronics. You had to go outside and you had to do things. Okay, look, I'm down the street. Same for you kids here with your neighbors. Are your neighbors outside gardening? No. Are your neighbors outside creating an outdoor lifestyle? They may be in the backyard, and you're not seeing them, because how many people now have, they grill, they barbecue, they have a, an outdoor kitchen on their patio, and they put a pot of flowers around there because it looks pretty. But that's not what a lot of us would consider gardening. That's back to kind of that throw pillow on the couch. It's more about decorating. It's not really about the physical act of, no, of learning, knowledge, and, engage, and engaging in gardening horticulture. It's more about lifestyles. So let's look about what others are saying. I don't know if you can read that up there, but this is from 2011. We came in number one, the worst 
college degree in America. Woohoo! <laughs> Number one, worst college degree in America. Now, the good news is, in 2014, we're not in the top 10. Okay? So we've fallen off. But basically, um, the perception is poor pay, you work hard, <coughs> it's really not a living. So CNN, Money Magazine, horticulture was the worst college degree. It really makes you feel good when you have a degree in horticulture. <laughs> like I said, no long ground there, but that's what others are saying. What others are saying, this is a blog. You guys all know what blogs are, right? This is one called Garden Rant. And basically what this person is ranting about is that higher education, universities, are educating people to maintain landscapes. Most importantly, turf. Why would anyone spend money, energy, educating people to care for turf? Golf courses, yes, all that's on there. So this is what's out there on the internet. That's what other people are reading and saying about our profession. It's worthless. I don't agree with that. Everyone's surprised. Everyone had to have their own opinion, but that's what people are saying. Okay, we're not the chemical company in horticulture, but we sometimes get brought into this. How many know that there's a whole organization out there wanting to bring down Monsanto Chemical Company? This website, Millions Against Monsanto. Monsanto makes a lot of products that are used in the horticulture industry. So a lot of times we're guilty by association. We're using those awful chemicals, those awful genetically modified plants out there. So sometimes we are then, like I said, brought into this of not necessarily being green. I think Dalton said that we're the original green industry. I don't know if society as a general rule of thumb would say that we are a green industry. And it's just not Monsanto. Bayer is also being taken on the task because they have a lot of the neonicotinoid insecticides that have been linked, allegedly linked, be careful how I say that, to the bee colony, bee collapse. So when we're out there in our gardens, in our landscapes, our careers, our professions, we're being watched. What pesticides, what products are we using? Are we really a green industry? Or are we in the back pockets of chemical companies? These are what people could say or are saying about the horticulture industry. So let's kind of continue to look more about society's views of horticulture in general. As a summary, gardening is work. We don't garden for fun. Us in this room, we do garden for fun. But here again, the neighbors up and down the street, they're not gardening. They're not out there for fun. You guys, you younger guys, especially uh, X, Y, and just don't go outside. It's not part of your, what, what's, what's ingrained you. We've kind of lost a lot of these younger generations. The baby boomers, me, we love gardening. These guys all think it's work. And now it's all about landscaping. Here again, back to the HGTV, the magazines, everything you see in the horticulture world. It's not about how to garden. Yes, there's horticulture. Yes, there's some fine gardening magazines. But most of them are really about selling lifestyles. It's about how we live, not how we garden. And people are saying, is it really a profession? You went to college for that? You got a degree in that? If I'm really sounding negative, I'm not meaning to. But I was asked to say what the trends are. I'm getting to the future here in a little bit, OK? So just hang on with me. And we're seen as not environmentally friendly, OK? I'm setting the stage for where we need to position ourselves for the future. We're not always seen as environmentally friendly. Even though Dalton had some very good slides on new projects, rain gardens, BMPs, those type of things. But as a rule, I'm not for sure if our industry is seen as environmentally friendly. So what are our challenges? So how do we engage people to become gardeners? How do we share the message that we are environmentally friendly?
And then I think we have to ask ourselves, is the answer really more fertilizers, pesticides, and waters, water for a healthy landscape? I think those are all things we need to look at. Are that really how we're going to grow the industry? And then, as I said before, there's the perception out there that the green industry is in the back of the big chemical companies. And you just saw what people, as, as a general rule of thumb, a section of our society thinks of Monsanto, they're big chemical. So those are our challenges. Do I think we can meet those? Yes, so that's where I become more positive. So let's look now more at what industry is saying. We talked about what society is changing, so let's uh, saying let's look more at industry. Ball horticulture, I think, uh, was mentioned earlier. Ball horticulture is one that I would call the leading breeders, researchers, developers of plants in the country and the world. And ball, in my estimation, probably does the best job of really studying trends and changes in consumers and in the industry. And this is out on the internet in greenhouse growers, so it's not my work, it's, it's Anna Ball's work in the Ball Company. Um, and so here's what they think is the future of the horticulture industry. Sustainability, okay? It's not a project, but it's a way of doing business. So in other words, how are we gonna respond? Are we just gonna give it lip service that horticulture is sustainable, or are we gonna, everything we do, prove that it is? And you heard really good things here this morning. You heard about Loma Vista and their pot recycling. As I said, you heard a lot of things that Dalton and Hermes was doing that was green. So yes, we're making progress, but are we really seen as a sustainable industry? And um, the edibles. You know, in my 30-year career, I would say probably 20 years ago, vegetable gardening was pretty much a dead hobby. You could walk into the grocery store 365 days a year, get pretty much anything you wanted. As a result of whether it's the economy crashing back in 2008, whether it's finally just the younger people wanting to return more to a healthy lifestyle, but whatever, I think now vegetable gardening is as popular as it was back, if you remember, in studying history, World War II with Victory Gardens. Okay? Local, fresh. They're wanting it pesticide free. They're not wanting organics. And um, vegetable gardens are not gardens. Vegetable gardens now are part of the landscape. It's not till they go raise vegetables, the garden, they raise vegetables for their lifestyle. Their lifestyle is fresh nutritious, homegrown. And if you haven't gathered by now, gardeners are fading. Old gardeners are just kind of composting away. Um, it's now all about decorating. It's decorating our landscape. In my gro growing up, gardening was a lifelong process. You know, it's just about continual learning. It was the journey. <coughs> That's not the way it's looked at today. And they're wanting, I think even Leica said that in her presentation, they're wanting instant gratification. I don't want to wait three months for it to flower. I don't want to wait a year to pick fruit off of it. I want it now. We're part of an instant gratification. And us in horticulture know you don't plant the seed today and you come back tomorrow and pick a tomato. It's about waiting, about a process. How do we get that back in there? And as with everything in industry, it's all consolidating. It's the big get bigger. Um, you know, going back to my farm roots, there were family farms all over the country side where I grew up. Now there's probably three or four farmers in the whole countryside. Instead of them back in my area having 1,000 acres, now they have five to 6,000 acres. So it's all getting bigger growing up. And uh, we need to focus on selling solutions not plants. Isn't that interesting? People are coming because they want, they want color. They want gratification. It's not so much about selling them plants as selling them solutions. And it's also positive that small independent garden centers that we know of, like the suburban, the family tree, according to Ball, um, will survive because they have quality selection 
and they have knowledgeable people. That's where you guys come in to help them and help these people find the solutions they're looking for. And we then also have the appeal to these younger people and novices. The quote in one of her research was, to Gen X and Gen Y, would they would compare themselves to grandma going to the mega electronics store. Now, I even think of that at my age, and my mother, who's um, quite a bit older than me, obviously, completely lost. You know, what a, what, she doesn't know what a smartphone is, you know. But think about how lost a 25-year-old, a 30-year-old, first-time homeowner is that's never gone outside in their life and walks into a garden center, even a, a Lowe's or a Home Depot. They have no idea whether it's a petunia or a tomato. They know absolutely nothing. The experience, according to this younger generation, just confuses and intimidates them. And many of them want to take the virtual tour before they go there. So how do you virtually take people through, I don't know, Matt, 30 acres of ground at your, um, at your Martin City location and learn about all these plant materials? Think how daunting that would be to that person. They go online and, and research every smartphone under the sun and know the specs of it, but it's really difficult for them to get into the mindset of researching which shade tree to plant or which flower to plant. And I think the other thing is we've always looked and at horticulture as it's a green industry. It's about the beauty we provide. But with the younger generations, it's just really not about lawns, flowers, trees, shrubs. Yes, it's for the beauty, but it's really not. We need to figure out how to let these individuals know that the value of horticulture really comes back to property values. Now, I know as a 19, 18, 17-year-old high school student or college student, property values probably don't mean that much to you, but it means something to your parents. It means something to the community you live in. We need to think about how a well-landscaped uh, area reduces crime, brings in tourism, people, energy cost. So what I guess I'm saying is we just aren't going to sell that horticulture makes a greener world. Horticulture makes a safer world, a healthier world. And so I think we need to look at it more in those terms that the younger generations will maybe understand. And we need to look at, here again, what they want. People don't really care anymore whether it's annual, perennial, or whatever. They saw it in Better Homes and Gardens. They saw it in HDTV. They want it. They don't really care what it is just so they can have it because they like it. So it's kind of back to that, that lifestyle. Um, here again, I threw this decorating idea out there. You know, people put a pillow on their couch. Well, they get rid of it and put one up there for Christmas or something like that. So that's what they really are looking for, is more how is horticulture going to affect their lifestyle. So now let's look what's happening in education. Budget cuts. Um, not just in Kansas, but in other states. The organization I work for, K-State Research and Extension, we continue to lose faculty. Our budgets are flat, we don't grow. Many universities are experiencing declining enrollments across the country. People are not going into the horticulture profession. Many horticulture departments are being merged into others so that the name recognition of horticulture is lost and to just an agricultural obis. And people don't know what horticulture is. That's a bizarre foreign term to them. I know even when I was in college of horticulture, you're, you're majoring in what? Horticulture. And this is the other perception that hurts us. That it's poor paying jobs with no future. I'm here to tell you that's not true, but that's the perception. 
You know, when you hear what engineer, engineering students are making versus horticulture students, yeah, there is a difference. But it doesn't mean you're going to go into a life of poverty, which is what the perception is. So what's higher education doing? Well, they're trying to retool. I will tell you that levels of higher learning do not change rapidly. They're slow to change. But many of them are changing names to be more friendly. Like here, Michigan State now is sustainable and organic horticulture. So here again, they're using those buzzwords that people are demanding our industry become. Colorado State, excuse me, Colorado State is landscape horticulture, is now environmental horticulture. So they're looking at that big picture of what society wants us to be. Um, also now it's just not about horticulture. When I was there at K-State, business, I had to take a few business classes, but not really, a lot. Now at Virginia Tech, landscape contracting students also get a minor in entrepreneurship. And Colorado State's added business degree requirements. So they're kind of rounding out the field. So not only can you grow it, but you also have to market and manage your business <coughs> that you work with. And of course, there's all new degrees coming up too. So I got these numbers from K-State the other day um, from Dr. Greg Davis. Uh, he told me that there's 131 undergraduates at K-State in horticulture. So that's been holding steady the last three, four years, which is not necessarily what's happening in other universities. Before the economy tanked back in 2008, there was nearly 400 students. And at that point in time, you have to realize that the golf course industry was really bloated. And a lot of people went into lawn care, lawn management. And of course, now with the economic collapse, the golf course industry is also hurting. And so there's not as much requirement for students. 26 graduate students. Interesting, they say that the number of students that are minoring in horticulture continues to go up. You really couldn't explain why, but maybe it is that younger generation trying to reconnect to their roots. So maybe they get a business degree and a minor in horticulture. The other thing he wanted to make sure that I told you guys was that every student finds a job coming out of K-State in horticulture. In fact, they can't get enough graduates. He tells me there's a demand for employers wanting more horticulture graduates. So there's the positive. He said the other really challenge is reaching the parents who have the perception that it's a blue collar job, low paying, no future. So we got to also work on your peers' parents so you will go into horticulture to keep it a green growing profession. So let's look at our challenges for the future. Does horticulture have a place? You betcha it does. Is horticulture relevant? Yeah. Uh, but the question is how does horticulture position itself for the future? At K-State, and I think the reason I brought this in is because it works everywhere. We've identified five grand challenges that are going to affect our futures. And those are feeding the world's population, our health, well-being, water issues, healthy, vital communities, and who's going to be our leaders for tomorrow. And when this first came out at K-State, that's in horticulture, like, well, wait a minute. Where do we fit in in these grand challenges of Kansas and the world? And we kind of struggled with that for a while. And finally, it's like horticulture fits in all five of these areas. We are tied directly to all these challenges that are facing our world. So yes, horticulture has a role. But it's actually, at the university level, taken us a while to let the deans, the directors, know that we fit in all five categories. Here again, it's about telling our story for the future. By 2050, there's going to be 9.6 9 .6 billion people. That's several billion more people than we have now. Some say to meet that growth, we're going to have to double the amount of food produced in the world so we don't have starving people. On the other hand, some say if we just utilize what we have, we can feed the world. 
Do you know that a third or more of all food produced is wasted in the United States and in the world? If we can do things. So there's job careers for handling, harvesting, storage. And the interesting thing is solutions may not always be in big commercial agriculture. Keep in mind we're feeding the world's population. And so we're looking at local food in some of these developing third world countries. So how are we going to find solutions for supporting sustainable production in developing countries? Which actually our target audience may be women. You know, uh, we may usually think of growing food as a man's world, but in these developing countries it's more of a woman's world. So our challenging Challenges are going to be inspiring innovations, investing in research, sustainable practices. <coughs> How are we going to develop, grow more food with less inputs? How are we going to get that market, the food, to markets so people have access to those foods, connecting farmers with markets? Like I made a comment about the number of community gardens and things and uh, farmers markets that keep increasing. And there's roles there in teaching people how to grow the food and then also building the political relationships to make sure this happens. Water, we all need water to live. Interesting enough, globally there's enough water in the world, but it's not where the people are. So we have water scarcity, lack of water in a region to meet demands. Phoenix is out of water by 2020. You really want to move to Phoenix? No water. Western Kansas, who is built on, its economy is built on the Ogallala Aquifer and agriculture. In 50 years, 69% of all that water will be used up. So what's going to grow in Western Kansas when there's no water and to support the Kansas economy? I don't know how many of you know that there's a plan, I think it's a $7 billion plan, to divert water from northeast Kansas out of the Missouri River, pump it uphill all across the state of Kansas, to Western Kansas to help irrigate properly. And the last estimate I saw was a billion dollars a year just to operate the system. Did you also hear the comment, pump water uphill? You know, Western Kansas has higher elevation than we do. Okay, so there's plenty of water challenges. So here's our challenges. How do we retain the beauty that people want and we do it with less water? Honestly, a lot of people don't think the horticulture industry cares about water. In Johnson County, we're kind of uh, different. We have plenty of water. That's not the right way the rest of the world embraces it, though. I think we also have to embrace native plants. There's been a lot of people dragging their feet about native plants. We've got to use these cultivars brought in. And then how do we develop low-input landscapes and crops? You know, I think everyone prefer a Johnson County landscape to Albuquerque, New Mexico, where it's a lot of gravel and a plant here, plant there. So we need to develop an attitude that water conservation is in the best interest of our industry. I don't think that's necessarily our attitude. You might not think of health as part of horticulture, but I think it is. It's about quality of life. It's access to food. It's through the entire stages of life, from birth to death. And everyone, no matter what economic group they're in, needs good health. I think horticulture is positioned to be there to help for the future. So how do we help promote a healthy lifestyle? Well, get out and garden, for one. Um, access to healthy food crops. And then food production methods that are going to uh, provide healthy access to food. And we also need to kind of change this mindset that gardening is not work. It's a lifestyle. Okay, just not the pretty plant, but also the acts of doing it. And you might wonder, well, how does leadership, leaders have to do with the horticulture industry? But someone has to be the spokesman for our industry and communicate that. So how will our industry go about preparing leaders in our industry for tomorrow? Because the question I'd ask, does the horticulture industry have a leader today? Does someone have that vision for what the horticulture industry is? And then how are we developing our leaders for tomorrow? And then who will take that leadership role on? And then who will be the voice for the future? And I think horticulture 
is uniquely positioned with community vitality issues. I think more so, you know, growing food, that's a brain, no brainer. But I think we need to make sure that people understand the value we bring into the community, the property values, the quality of life. Uh, we all know that a well landscaped home, less crime, safer neighborhoods, increased property values. So Ball Research said it's beyond beauty. So how do we promote that the green end of Excuse me? So how do we promote the green industry, uh, what it does for the community, and how do we get recognition for the value of horticulture in their communities? We're just kind of taken for granted. I don't think people really think about it, consider it. So it's back to that leadership. Who's going to tell our story? So here I think you can draw pretty good conclusions which neighborhood you would rather live in or be around. That's what we do for communities. So horticulture in the 21st century, what is it going to look like? I think we need to green the field. We need to be environmentally aware, not just in talk, but in our actions. We need to promote practices that have less inputs, but still have the beauty. And as I said, embrace it, not just in words, but actions and go back to the saying that every day to the green industry is Earth Day. It's just not one day a year that we stop and think about the Earth. And I, I think most of us in this room would agree that every day it should be Earth Day. I think we need to do a better job of promoting and branding the field of horticulture. Um, new image for the degree, maybe, so people don't think it's low-paying, blue-collar work. We need to take charge of the message I think we've allowed too many other people to take charge of our message, go back to the millions against Monsanto, the garden rants, those type of things. And I think we need to develop a unified message. And here's a few examples of what agriculture has done. Dairy Council got milk. Now it's life milk or something like that. I still like got milk. Look what the beef industry has done. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Everyone knows that saying, right? Even you guys do or pork, the other white meat. So what is the tagline for horticulture? Growing your future. But does that resonate across the world? Has someone spent millions of dollars on a checkoff program to ingrain that in people's minds? No. People don't know what the horticulture industry is. Get growing. Get growing. A lot of good ideas, but Putting in this room and getting so they're in the mindset of the average American consumer is two different things. These are in the mindset of the average American consumer. Horticulture is not. And we need to engage more youth in the field for multiple reasons. They're future consumers, they're future students, they're future employees, and most importantly, future business owners. Who's going to be the next Dalton Hermes, the next Stewicks, the next Ryan Lawn and Tree? Who's going to be that next generation? Or a lot of these businesses have been taken on. How are they going to be moved on to another generation? That's an issue that's in the farming agriculture world. Who's going to be the next generation of farmers? So with that, I will open up, I think, got a few more minutes. For questions, you agree, disagree with me? Yes? How does K-State as a leader in horticulture in this region engage young people, and particularly young women in the industry, as people move through their professions? I see about half this room is well, pretty well split, but most of the young women will drop out of that industry by the time they get to college. What is K-State doing to address this? That is a really darn good question, and honestly, I'm not in recruiting of students, but I have a feeling they're not doing a lot. So what are you doing in your role to address that? Well, my role is not the traditional education, with extension, my part. I, I think my main role is to promote horticulture, to let people know that it is a valuable education, there is a future in it, uh, and try to encourage people to go into it. But as far as university, other universities, 
They do not have a recruiter for the Department of Horticulture on campus. I agree. I will say, out in the industry, I'm seeing a lot of women nowadays. Yes. Like our field mm -hmm. is it's mostly women. It's 90% women. So I don't know. I've been out of school for a while, so I don't know what's going on on that front. But out in the industry, I'm seeing a lot of women out there. Now. There's a lot. There's a big movement for women in agriculture in general, and horticulture is part of agriculture. I know in extension and loan, we're hiring more females into agricultural roles than males in the last five years, 10 years. So you are seeing more of that, animal science and industry, veterinary medicine, all across the board, you're seeing more women take an active role in agriculture. Yes. I would totally agree with you, and I, if I made comments that led you to believe I was looking down on it as a blue-collar job, that was not my intent. That's the my general perception. That's the general perception. Uh, and that's something we've got to, to get over, though, yeah. is that it's not always a bad. But that's the perception, especially if you're looking at Johnson yeah. County families, where most Johnson County households are white-collar families, and encouraging your child to go into a blue collar profession or what's perceived, I think is more the issue right there. Yes. Yeah. I'm going to argue that it's not a perception. I don't think most of us care one way or the other, but we're perceived as a blue collar job. I just want to make the white collar income. <laughs> <laughs> Value the, value of the degree too. Correct. Yes. What I was hoping today was to stimulate a little bit of good, I think I'm out of time, would be to stimulate some discussion and thought. I think that's why I phrased and used the term challenges for the industry, more than innovations and trends. I think I did it more as, as the challenges for what our industry faces. She's in charge, not me. Yeah. <laughs> as a K-State alum myself, why don't we just start a green-collar job movement? Yeah. <laughs>